Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Really excited to be still in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We are at the Sioux Falls School District's Instructional Planning Co Center. Center, IPC. And there, this is how we develop a school district for 25,000 kids in this area of the southeast corner of South Dakota. This is my hometown, as you know, and we are, are sitting down with two people that are at the forefront of developing out this school district. We have both Dr. Teresa Boyson and Dr. Brian Maher joining us. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the backgrounds are really great here. Teresa has been working in the Sioux Falls School District for 25 years. She was the principal at Harvey Dunn for 12 years and then also taught um, for multiple years before that third and fourth grade. Right. And, um, and also taught sports yes. as well and has had a huge track record there. Uh, Brian Maher uh, was at Kearney prior to being superintendent here, which is in Nebraska. He was there superintending for eight years and now has been here three and a half years with the Sioux Falls School District as a superintendent and Teresa's assistant superintendent. And I, we're really excited to talk about developing out a school district and all of the nuance that goes into this because it is, how do you mold the 25,000 minds into our world? How do you assess? What's the curriculum like? What's, you know, from the national level? How do you keep up with exponential technology? Sioux Falls is burgeoning in population, so we passed a $190 million school bond, so we'll be talking about that. Really excited to unpack this with you both. Thank you again. Let's, let's start, um, even before we talk about molding 25,000 minds into our world, what sparked the fire under you to care about education and kids? And yeah, take turns. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, since I have the mic, I'll go ahead and start. Awesome. I, I think for me, it was uh, really the adults in my life uh, when I was a, when I was young. Um, I grew up very poor in a, in a small small Nebraska town, and uh, really had some some motivators for me who were teachers and coaches who uh, made me believe I could do more than I really thought I could. And that was kind of my spark to get into education, uh, to be able to do what they were doing. Um, growing up poor, when I looked at teachers, I thought, gosh, they make a pretty good living. They can, they can do well. And uh, of course, I think now our, our teachers are grossly underpaid. Yes. Uh, but that was, that was a motivator for me to, to, to get me going and get into the field of education. That's interesting because I believe that most people that get into ed education have that same history. You have someone in your life that was impactful for you um, when you were younger with it in the school district. And I grew up in the Sioux Falls School District. And so that's exciting for me, um, third through 12th grade here, um, and the teachers that made an impact on my life. And for me to pursue my education and then come back here and to see some of those teachers again, but then those, those watch the students as they go through and the impact that we can have on education in our community. It's, it's a reoccurring theme that we've seen with all of the entrepreneurs and different people we host on the show where they say that mentorship has been yeah. such an influence on their development. And it's also one of the biggest uh, contributors to success as well as having some sort of mentors and influence that drew, drove you to care about this. So, okay, so now you see your, so within, these, within these teacher roles and administrator roles, you've slowly been better and better understanding about, okay, thousands, tens of thousands of children. Well, I mean, we're talking you know, billions of kids around the world need their need to be molded into society in a way that they can be fully actualized themselves, contribute to the collective. How does one even go through the process of dealing with a 25,000 school student school district and figuring out how to best assess, make a curriculum? It seems super complicated and hard to, to actually do. Right. Do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think when you look at it in that context, that very broad context, it is super hard and, and really tough to do. 
In fact, as you're asking that question, I'm going, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. <laughs> I think what you what you do really is you figure out what can I do right now. Yes. As you were as you were formulating that question, one of the things that came to my mind was a came from a book that I read on John Wooden, who was a famous mm -hmm. college basketball coach at UCLA. And uh, one of the things in his book that he said was, it's what you learn after you know it all that really matters. And I think there have been several times in my life um, where I thought I knew it all, and I've learned so much after that. Now what, I've, now what I think I realize is, I know more today than I knew yesterday. And hopefully I'll be able to say that tomorrow and next week and next month. And that's really, I think, where we are as a school district, too. What do we do? What do we know now? And what are we doing now? But really, how are we developing the minds of kids to think? Because it's very clear now, if you look at history, that uh, we're, not, we're not preparing kids for the world that I live in, just as the teachers that I had didn't develop me to live in the world that they lived in. But they did develop in me uh, an ability to think and, a, and an ability to think critically so that I could handle those issues that came my way, uh, whether that's uh, society, societally, uh, politically, what, whatever realm those issues came in. And I think that's our charge. And that's an evolving charge. So we don't ever have the answer, but hopefully we continually put together an answer. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, my title is Academic Achievement. And so within that, everything curriculum and assessment. And so in the Sioux Falls School District, when you look at, we have pre-K 12, um, 25,000 students. How do we assess what we're doing and make changes so the students are college and career ready? And it starts in kindergarten. It starts before kindergarten. And the challenges that our students come in with the student, we have to meet their needs at the door, um, look at where every student is. If I have a classroom of 25 students, I know I have 25 different needs because yeah. all students are different. And that teacher has a big job of being able to build that relationship with them, know where they are academically, emotionally, socially, and develop all those skills so we have a well-rounded child at the end. And then when we look at the other end, college and career ready, continually to develop pathways and look at the businesses in our local community and how we can work together to support um, the businesses and feed their need also, but also have that student be able to take courses that are relevant for them, but also fill their passion. So it's a big charge, but again, continually examining what we're doing um, what's working, what's not look, working, look for those bright spots and build on those. There was two things there that just really drove me, one from each of you, with just, it was almost like there's a torch that's being passed on from the previous generations to us now, and then now it's our turn to figure out how to add more to the torch and figure out where to keep pushing education forward. And then also this this I, the idea that when even when you get a classroom of students, you have a diverse population of minds and and just even dealing with not only different learning styles but also different parental involvements in education, uh, different socioeconomic statuses. Um, there's so much of that of that nuance where some kids are reading already at multiple levels beyond the classroom. And there's some kids that are still a level maybe behind in reading. So how do you teach? As a teacher, this is extremely difficult to, to, to be able to do. So, okay, so let's let's talk about the, the, the app. How does a curriculum build, how do, how do we figure out, so the torch was kind of passed with the curriculum. It's been developed over time and also how we assess. But then there's like the national standards and testing that have to happen. So we're always trying to prep for the national testing. And then, but then also there's the exponential technology that we're adding into the picture. So how does that all play out? Okay. Um, so when you think about curriculum, of course we look at the national standards and the state standards and how they feed into that. And we have a process for reviewing that curriculum and those standards and purchasing a curriculum that's going to 
meet the standards, meet the students' needs, and provide the ability for the teachers to add their own flavor into that also um, to meet the diverse needs of all our students. When we look at your comment of we have students that are reading beyond our grade level or below our grade level, providing the teacher supports and avenues to be able to differentiate that learning for those students, that's really important, uh, and to be able to meet all their needs because we know that within that one classroom, you have multiple levels, whether it's math, writing, reading, all of those subjects, um, we do have those different levels. The state assessments and the national assessments that we're required to take, our curriculum, when by meeting the needs, by meeting those standards, feeds into that assessment. So if we're using the materials that we have purchased in the curriculum writing and the testing, that we do with in-house, it does feed those very naturally. So it's a good process. We have a great team that helps. We have teacher input on all those committees mm -hmm. and writing in-house assessments. We have district assessments that align mm -hmm. with our curriculum, align with the state and national standards to give us benchmarks along the way. So we're not waiting till the end to see if our students make the mark. We're mm -hmm. assessing that along the way. And so we can make changes as needed. And we know from one group to the next, we do need to make changes. So it's a great process. It's a great school district that really does value the feedback of the teachers. We look at the assessments along the way to make adjustments in the curriculum to make sure we're hitting the mark for our kids. So yeah. they, ha they can, you know, we have AP classes, our ACT scores are above the state and national and it's because, we believe it's because of that process. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Sure, I, I think it hits the mark. What we'll see, um, to oversimplify a meta-analysis done by John Hattie, uh, planning, engagement, and feedback. Mm -hmm. That's the learning cycle. Mm -hmm. our, our best teachers, no matter what curriculum they're, they're putting in front of students, no matter what content they're in charge of, no matter what age of the students that they're in charge of. Planning, engagement, and feedback. Our best teachers are great planners. They're great at engagement, and they give quality feedback. And if you're missing one of those pieces, uh, the, the, the whole curriculum development, educational cycle bogs down. And it doesn't matter if you're in charge of 50 students, or 25,000 students, or 125,000 mm -hmm. students. If you can master the planning, the engagement, the feedback, you will be doing right by the kids that we serve. And that's our, that's our challenge every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, as you were speaking, I was also hearing this importance of feedback, and then you gave this yeah, planning, engagement, feedback cycle. And then there's all of the importance of adding in the right sort of, you have AP classes, you have these different, you have, how, how does one even deal with a national assessment, but also a state assessment? And I really enjoyed the way that, you know, the if, if, you, have a, if you have a teacher that's doing a really good job planning, assessing, uh, engaging, and then assessing, planning, engaging, and then getting feedback. Um, that that process is just, it does seem like kind of like it's a really good gold standard for education. I, I gave an analogy earlier, or I gave a, a little talk earlier about John Wooden. I'll go to another sport and another coach. Who, Tom, Tom his Austin. son, Brian's son, is a kicker for the Cowboys. And you like football a lot. You know, I, I did and I still do. You still do, yeah. But, but I think the, the best coaches uh, there, there's a lot of uh, leadership qualities that you can take for them that, that is generalized beyond the sport. I'll give an example of uh, Tom Osborne. You know, growing up in Nebraska, you know, you, uh, Tom Osborne was the head football coach at the University of Nebraska for a number of years. And he talked about more than winning in, a, in one of his books. And really his point was this, that if you, if you don't worry about winning, and I'll use the, uh, the analogy there, if I don't worry about what those state and national standards are, and they're important, so don't, don't, I, I don't want to just dismiss them. But if I don't worry too much about what they are, rather I worry about 
blocking and tackling, mm. I'm going to win enough. Yeah, that's interesting. If, if I worry about the fundamentals of the game of football and I get exceedingly good at those fundamentals in football, I'm going to win a lot of football games. I make, I make that transference to education. And I think if we do enough things right in terms of teaching kids how to think critically mm -hmm. and all those things that Dr. Boyson talked about in terms of developing the curriculum, and all those things are necessary. But if in the end we think about how do we teach kids to think critically, those assessments are going to take care of themselves. How we perform on our state and national standards will all take care of themselves. If we think about how we bring that individual along, it's kind of like planning engagement and feedback. It's that simple and it's that complex. It's hard to stay focused on those little things because we're always getting the soup of the day to come in and help with reading or help with writing or help with math. And really what we want to do is make, make sure that we're teaching kids how to think critically because they come to us at all different levels. You mentioned uh, poverty. Um, if, if all of our kids came to us at the same spot in terms of their development, the, the job would be easier. Now I would contend it would be less fun, mm -hmm. but, it would, but it would be easier. If we get kids who can't nearly read at grade level, as you mentioned, and we get kids who are reading multiple years ahead of grade level mm -hmm. in the same class, how do we teach them to read, but how do we teach them to be consumers of that information and to think critically? That's the, that's the complexity that we're dealing with. That's the challenge that we deal with every day. Yeah. That part I don't think has changed since I was a kid. Yeah. And I don't think it'll change for a long time. Yeah. The technology's changed tremendously. Along the way, yeah. But, yeah. but how do we think and how do we think critically so that we can consume and react to that information? That, I think, is our chief charge. And I don't know how you assess that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so as we talk about curriculum and assessment, how does a school district figure out how to stay up at the cutting edge of all the exponential technologies? You have programs like Code to the Future, which is really exciting, getting kids playing with MIT Scratch-based programming language. So these sort of way, they're kind of the cutting edges of getting kids involved in STEM education. You were at the STEM uh, summit this summer, yeah. the summer um, in DC, and so tell us a, tell us about that. Well, that was really exciting to be a part of. Number one, uh, just the fact that it's in DC and the energy that goes uh, with that, but also seeing our our country saying we're we're, we're going to take a uh, a forward stance in this whole STEM conversation. So. That was, uh, that was excellent, uh, just to be a, a part of that. And uh, not, only, not only was it uh, the, the folks from education there, but you had business and industry there, as well as uh, obviously government there. So those are, those are three entities that uh, don't always play nicely together. And we were all there under a common, under a common theme. So that was good. Um, to your question mm -hmm. of how do we stay on the cutting edge, I think that's a question that we always are asking ourselves. How do we stay on the cutting edge? And how do we stay on the cutting edge without becoming um, just gimmick, it, it just adopting something because it looks good? Uh, I'm reminded years ago of uh, how we had some distance learning labs put together, and we were very proud of this room because it looked 21st century back in the early 1990s. and. And um, one of my colleagues said to me, how often do you use this room with your students? And just almost took me to my knees because we didn't use it nearly to the capacity that we could have used it. So what do we, what do, we do to stay on the forefront that really impacts kids? Uh, that's something that I think that, uh, that we're always thinking about. How, so how do we do it? Uh, for us, I, I would say there are a couple of ways. Number one, uh, we're the only school district in the state of South Dakota that's part of uh, a national group called the League of Innovative Schools, cool. Digital Promise. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we are with like-minded districts around the nation twice a year trying to figure out, um, number one, what technology is out there, but how does that te technology impact critical thinking for the students that we serve, and, and how do we do that? Uh, I can tell you the folks here, they, they 
break into hives when I go to those meetings because I always come back with ideas that I want them to implement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but but I think it's through being involved in those think tanks, think tanks, and getting out of the day to day uh, grind, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, in, in in being a part of that that national movement on how do we improve education nationally and we do it by improving education in Sioux Falls mm -hmm. we, we do it by improving education locally mm -hmm. Teresa thoughts on the exponential technology sure. yeah um, you, you spoke to code to the future and code to the future is um, a coding that we do with K through 8 students now and it really has helped students to think differently about um, how what their careers could look like but what else is out there and when Dr. Maher talked about um, teaching students to think critically and persevere that really Code to the Future really has helped um, students do that we see leaders in those classrooms who might not have been leaders before but now it's another avenue for them to shine and so that's been a great thing for Sioux Falls you know avionics um, robotics all of those technologies that we have and then how do we use just our everyday Chromebooks that we have in the hands of second through 12th graders and to make sure it's it's not just an addition or replacing paper but how do we use it differently so they're not just a consumer of technology but a, a user of technology and so continually mm -hmm. to support our instructional coaches to and our instructional coaches support our teachers to look at things differently um, using an LMS, a learning management system mm -hmm. within their classroom to model that platform of um, online learning, really looking at micro-credentialing for our staff. And so that's where they can do personalized staff development for them, but they can do that on their um, at a time that works for them in an area that works for them that we support and we know that's good quality professional development. So really looking outside the box of um, that traditional learning, but that traditional staff development for our um, Sioux Falls district staff. Mm -hmm. <sighs> STEM is such an important field that is just exploding across every single industry. So to have a, a, a focus on that and a focus on just cutting edge use of technology in the classrooms in ways that both maximize the the child's ability to critically think but also minimize their, you know, their distractions actually Brian when you're mentioning earlier the in the interesting analogy of playing a game of, of football and getting really good at the basics of whatever sport or whatever even potentially drawing or art or whatever the coding what are the basics that there's these the, the distractions come in as well and so to 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 block out the distractions is, is so important especially with um, the development of a cutting-edge technology because it can be used for for distraction as well let's talk about the explosion of the population in Sioux Falls and how that's affecting class sizes in the schools. It was so cool to read about the $190 million school bond that was passed for the Sioux Falls School District here. The, could, that's gonna fund the construction of a new high school, a new middle school, a new elementary school, and then uh, do renovations on additional educational infrastructure. And that is, that's so exciting to be, you know, to think about, especially because uh, there will be a, it's not only that the city cares a lot about the economic development of, of the city as well as the, the minds of the children, but also that it's great to see that the class sizes will hopefully decrease so that a, a teacher will have maybe 25 children instead of 32 or, or whatever. So they'll have, uh, they can focus maybe more on each uh, individual child's development. So there's a, there's a lot of good that's going into this. There's the school itself, uh, you, you're, there's so much nuance that goes into this, but the, the architecture of the new schools you hopefully have more natural light coming in, more of an ambiance of maybe some nature involvement in it. So that's, uh, this is all really cool stuff and we're excited to learn from you about what this process has been like. Mm -hmm. Teach us about it. Can we talk about the bond first? Or? Sure. 
Sure. Well, the first thing I'd say about a bond, if you have, if you have anybody watching this and they're trying to figure out yeah. where to relocate, Sioux Falls, South Dakota might not jump to your, to your list of places to be, but if you have kids and you need them educated, I, I know I'm biased, but I can't think of a better place than Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I, I'll, I'll offer this for evidence. We just asked the, the, the folks who live in this school district, we asked them to raise their taxes. Yeah. That's what we, we asked them to spend more money. Yeah. It, 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 and those things, those votes are always 50-50. I mean, they're close to, to, if you pass it, it's by the hair of your chinny-chin-chin. Yeah. Chin, yeah. You know, I mean, it's our, our yes vote on that, on that bond issue. So we said, will you vote yes to raise your taxes? Yeah. 85.46 of the voters yeah. said yes. That's phenomenal. That's I huge. I think it's unprecedented. Yeah, yeah. And, and until somebody tells me it's not, I'm, I'm going to go with that. Yeah. That's amazing to have 85 out of 100 voters, more than 85 out of 100 voters, say, yes, do that. To me, that doesn't speak to, to me or, or to us, but it speaks to the commitment to education in this city. Yep. And, it, and the, the folks in this community understand that this isn't about K-12 education. This isn't about ending at the age of 18. This is about taking this city and continuing to have it grow and continuing to have a workforce that allows it to grow. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is we're, uh, we're preparing students like you, Alan, who are going to go make their mark well beyond the city of Sioux Falls as well as hopefully uh, have, have their mark in, in the city of Sioux Falls. But yeah. that, that's kind of my my commercial, but it's all based in fact on mm -hmm. th there. I, I know this, there isn't a better place to be a superintendent of schools than the Sioux Falls School District. To have that support is incredible. Uh, and, and then now it's a matter of now, how do we, how do we make sure that the trust that was placed in us uh, manifests itself in quality outcomes for the students of this, of this city? Mm -hmm. That's our, that's our goal. That's kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is a multi-year project is looking like till yeah. potentially three, four, almost four years. Yeah, probably, of, yeah. probably, four, probably four or five years before we see everything come to fruition. Yep. Um, probably uh, three years before we actually have a new high school and a new <laughs> middle school built and, and we're moved into them. But in the meantime, we're, we're really engaging folks from the community to help us make sure that the design is what we want it to be. And I don't mean just from an aesthetically pleasing uh, perspective, but from a functionally relevant perspective, so that yeah. again we're trying to do, we're gonna we're gonna live in this building for a long time, yeah. so we don't want it just to be ready to go three years from now. But how yeah. can it be? How can it be relevant thirty, forty, fifty years yeah. from now yeah. for educating the kids that are going to to yeah. come along at that point in time? Mm -hmm. Thoughts, Teresa? Sure. Um, Part of that work on, like Dr. Maher referenced, is making that building useful now and in the future. And yeah. that's that architect and the de design team has really been instrumental with us and engaging us in what does education, what will the facilities do now, but then in the future, and how does it look different yeah. than a Roosevelt, a Lincoln, or a Washington, our current yeah. high school models. And so that- A lot different. A lot different. <laughs> And it has been really fun to dream big and to look at other options out there. Yeah. And so we really are in that, those initial phases with the architect and the design team to see where we can go, but then how's our teaching philosophies match that also. So lots of challenges, exciting or challenges or opportunities um, to look at that education system and what's it mean for our students in terms of STEM and um, entrepreneurship yeah. and all of those opportunities or those pathways for kids. Yeah, I, I remember watching a video where you were discussing with some press about well, there will be a certain time that we are able to deal with the architects and we're getting proposals and we are also looking to um, find a really important name that sticks uh, on the school that it's, it's indicates that we care about the future. Um, we 
are thinking about the, you, all these different layouts and how the school can stay relevant over time, the locations of building them. This is, this is very, very difficult to be able to figure out how to actually deal with the developing school district in a population that's, that's increasing in size. So what I have been then, because when, when we were first talking, I ended up writing a very little bit uh, a blog post about how I thought it was, it was interesting how when we were speaking that I learned from you that, well, shouldn't we really be thinking about what is across the street from these buildings? Because if there is a, you know, if there are archaic sort of, of businesses across the street, then the, then the kids may go and eat unhealthy and they may not be as inspired as if there were maybe healthier food options, exercise options, art options, business options, art, entrepreneurship options, science options. And that's why one of the reasons why this high school is being built next to the, the Career Tech okay. Academy and uh, Southeast Tech and Zeal Center for Entrepreneurship and that, the, up in that um, northwest corner. And so, so maybe speak on, on, on some of the, the complexity that goes on with what we were just talking about, but also the importance of, of how you are planning to develop out the areas next to the to the schools and how much involvement even the Sioux Falls School District has in those decisions. Mm -hmm. I, can speak, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I can speak to how do we engage the Career Tech Academy and Southeast Tech with yeah. the new high school, because those are three of our entities that, um, you know, we're one of the unique school districts where the Southeast Technical Institute is under the Sioux Falls School District or a part of the Sioux Falls mm -hmm. School District. So how can we work with that tech academy and our career at tech academy to develop courses for our students where they it can easily flow between the three of them and then use the Zeal Center for Entrepreneurship that's right across the street also. Yeah. So really looking at those pathways, you know, a medical pathway, we're working on that, a computer um, cyber pathway, we're working on that, and both Career Tech Academy and Southeast Tech play into that. And that would just be a natural flow for, the, for that high school, but for our other three high schools also. And um, just opportunities for students that they hadn't thought of before. So, yeah. and making sure we can publicize that and get that information into the family's hands, but also the student's hands, so they can take full opportunity of that. Mm -hmm. I think maybe just to extend on that too, we have a, we have a great relationship with our business community mm -hmm. that plays into that relationship with Southeast Technical Institute, with the, the, the Zeal Center, and opportunities that we have to be nimble uh, rather than to take years to adapt to what our community needs, uh, maybe we can take months to adapt to what our community needs, whether that be uh, from a manufacturing standpoint or remember, whether that be from a business startup standpoint, we can be real nimble uh, into what our community really needs. That's, that's number one. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I would say in terms of the development, we looked at a lot of things in terms of where we would place this high school certainly the synergy that exists with the technical institute right there the career and technical education academy right there the proximity to those two uh, mm -hmm. facilities mm -hmm. was a piece of it but from a very practical standpoint we had to have about 45 acres of land yeah and, and yeah. so to find 45 <laughs> acres of land in a in a developing city is uh, is sometimes Tough. difficult so yes. there was a, a practical piece there and in terms of how will things develop around there, mm -hmm. I don't know what our impact will be. But I think the biggest impact is the fact that we've said this is where we want a, an educational facility to exist. So yes. now we'll see how the area develops around Yeah, there. Certainly there'll be um, residential that will, there will, that be, will yeah. develop. There's already a lot of residential developing out in the Northwest. Yeah. yeah. Tons yeah. of residential. So I, it'll, it'll be exciting. It'll be it'll be mm -hmm. fun. Twenty five years from now to look back to see how that did develop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just be blunt about it. I really don't want to see McDonald's and a Burger King on those corners. I think it's I think that's way 
uh, archaic. It's way um, overdue to have uh, a, a different sort of uh, style of, 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 of corners uh, that are developed in the suburbs of, of Sioux Falls. That it, it can potentially be a, um, a, <clears throat> a model corner right over there where the new high school is going to be. It could be a model corner where you see um, healthy options for food, you see, um, um, you see a center for art, you see a, an exercise center. Um, and when the kids every day drive past it, their brand recognition moves towards health and to, um, to, to, to tech and art instead of to old archaic technologies that, uh, and, and um, businesses. It's very possible somebody would sell you the land out there to develop that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I hope that, that it, some, someone that's watching this from the Sioux Falls community um, will, will take on that initiative of wanting to develop the land next to those 45 acres and, and take it in that direction instead of, um, instead of in the old, um, incumbent directions that we see developing out on so many uh, corners of, 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 uh, of the developing areas of, of Sioux Falls. Now, so now th this, is, this has been, this is, there's a lot that goes into developing a school district and we were only uh, talking about, you know, really the tip of, of, of everything. It's so difficult to get down to all of the glacier that's located below the water that that exists. I mean, it, and in in a sh short, less than hour conversation to try and understand how a school district works, super tough. Um, and we'll aim to do this again when we come back to, to to Sioux Falls and talk to you more about what's going on. Do these check-ins and 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 build out a better understanding for people about what actually goes on within a school district and how it grows. Um, last thoughts uh, on the way out. There's usually one thing that someone can recommend that is maybe most profound for, for students, for, for teachers, for parents. What is the one thing that you can maybe say could accelerate, to, to turn into a habit for a student for a teacher, for a parent, what is that one habit that you think could be developed that could maximize the potential of education in our world? Ooh. You get to go first. <laughs> oh, so, oh, so, so my, my, kind of my reaction, when I get something that's a real deep question like that, I go with, all right, what, what just popped into my mm -hmm. mind? Two things popped into my mind, and I think about my own development. And n neither of these were natural for me, but both of them are commonplace for me today. Mm -hmm. Two things that I do on a regular basis that I think have made a tremendous difference in my life and a tremendous difference in my ability to think critically, yeah. which is a theme you've heard me yeah. go back to time and time and time again today. One is um, to meditate yes. and to take time to, to be reflective. And yeah. you, you, there are a number of different ways that 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 can happen, so I'm not here to profess that uh, there's one day, one way that's better than any other way. Yeah. But I can say for me, it's important and it's important daily. Yeah. And the second thing, and I don't know which of these I'd pick, I'd probably pick meditation if I could only do one, uh, but the other is to read. Yeah. And it, to, it, it, Definitely. To get yourself to think by reading. And to me, it doesn't even really matter what you're reading, whether it's self-help or fiction. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know mm -hmm. that it really matters, uh, but I think it's important that you read. And as a, as a youngster growing up, I'd much rather be out shooting a basketball than reading. And so reading mm -hmm. wasn't something that was natural for me, but I, over time, realized how important it was for me, and it has become natural for me as a result of understanding its importance. Yeah, those are so good. Mm -hmm. And I would go back to um, what's important, and for me it's, is it reflection, um, meditation, or time for exercise, whatever that looks like for you, but that reflection and taking time to reflect on mm -hmm. your day and what worked, what didn't work, um, what are you going to change and look forward to, 
and you know right now information is so readily available yeah. and making sure you research your options and if we're talking about kids listen to them take time for them show them let let them have time to um, develop their passions and spend time with them because when you spend time with your kids or whether it's kids in your classroom it comes back to you and you develop those relationships so taking that time is really, really important to develop their interests. So. Oh, those were so good. I love those. Um, we, f we frequently talk about that, just s how important it is to reflect, how important it is to turn off the stimuli that we're constantly taking in and just breathe and be silent and go inward for periods of time, even a couple minutes a day, and what that does for our development, for our physiology, for our creativity, for our gratitude that we have, love and compassion, um, and also, of course, just turning these things into, into, into habits of passing time with, with our kids and the development. Um, so, so good. Okay, last question. What do you guys think is the most beautiful thing in the world? I would say love, that whether it's love for another person or love for your environment, and it's that passion that goes with it, so that, that would be my answer, is love for each other and the world and the environment. Well, that's way too deep for me, Alan, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a whole different direction here. I'm headed tonight, I'm gonna get on a plane, I'm gonna go to Dallas. Cool. I'm going to watch the Dallas Cowboys play mm -hmm. in the playoffs tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the most beautiful thing I can see this weekend is made kicks. Yeah, I mean, that's I right. Dallas Cowboys that's kicker. Right. That's, that's right. the most beautiful thing in my life this weekend. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> this weekend. How about outside of yeah. the playoffs in football? It's, it uh, probably is. A, as a grandparent, maybe I, I think the most beautiful thing is watching the development of my own grandkids mm -hmm. and then try to transfer that to the development that we're in charge of for the for the kids in yeah. the city and, and really and, and to, to, to kind of see that natural evolution and the iteration that is that, that human development mm -hmm. that's what i'm committed yeah. to and that's what i think is a, a beautiful thing yeah Wow. For this weekend, it's made kicks. It's made kicks. It's those long field goals. Even the short, yeah. ones, Even the short ones are so important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Even the short ones are so important. Um, wow, what a pleasure this has been. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Teresa you Boyson, much. and Brian Maher. Thank you pleasure. so much. Thank you guys both so much. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear from you. What would you think are the big principles and points that we should be discussing around molding children into our world, educating children, developing our school districts. How can we best do this around the world? Let us know about what's going on in your communities and your districts as well. And also build the future, manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Go build, create, execute. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you soon. Bye.